Hello. Before this video begins, I would like to warn you viewers that the Blood and Gore DLC was active in this video, so it may get a bit graphic and brutal. So viewer discretion is advised because it may not be for everyone. Now that that's out of the way, we can begin. Hello and welcome to episode 1 of the Rome 2 Unfortified Port Slash Town Defense Against Great Odds. This series will talk about the general units used by the AI and what might be found in your garrison. While doing my research, I realized that my last video was a bit unrealistic because I had the town and barracks fully upgraded. So for it to be more helpful to you, I decided to completely restart my research and use simple and low level garrisons. So let's get started. So let's get started with this video. So I'm going to pause it for right now because the enemy is quite close and they advance quite quickly. So I'm um, to explain how I set up for this battle. Now I know this town is actually very similar, if not the same layout as for my last episode when I was playing as Pompey's Rome. But the same strategy basically applies. What we do is we want our strongest unit where we expect the most resistance. Now when it's playing AI, when we're playing against AI, it's very easy to overall know where the majority of the enemy force is going to, to come from. When you see the enemy form up when the battle starts, that's basically the path they're going to try and follow. So since they're in the right side, but still a bit close to the center, I'm predicting they'll go mostly right but also down a bit down the center so that's why because i'm expecting the most resistance on the right side because that's where the majority of the enemy force is located i'm putting the the strongest and the majority of units to the right side so i have principes which are my strongest unit in this battle uh guarding this right side then i have two hastati units now i could just have the principes hold by themselves they're quite a strong unit especially at this point in the game because we're playing about early to mid game and they can hold their own they will fight and they will be a great distraction against the enemy soldiers but i also decided to put hastati because normally in battles the ai sits about the center so they might go left right center or anywhere but here they've actually set up to mainly on the right side so i'm expecting that oh they might not split up as much, they might concentrate more in certain areas. So I'm putting more soldiers here than I usually would. And then here in the center I have two Hastati units. Now I could just put the Vigiles or Plebs that I have, but I decided not to. Because seeing how actually close the enemy formation is to the center, they could charge down here. And, I w and since I have a few spare units that I didn't put to the right side, I might as well put them because they can still put up a good fight and will be worth putting here so they can hold much better than the other units. Now as you see I put my levies here uh, behind all of these three units and in this specific position. Now I could put them all the way here. Now this could be good because you have much more access and you are not blocked by the building. But the problem with this is because you are behind a lot more soldiers, so you have a lot more chances of friendly fire and problems. But I decided to put them here, on the slanted position like this. So some of them fire over the men, while others have a better shot like this. As you can see, they don't have to worry about hitting as many of our men. They have a clearer shot of the enemy and have easier access. Now, I also, before this battle itself starts, I have to mention this. I know there's a cavalry unit here, and a normal garrison does not usually have cavalry units. The only reason I'm putting a cavalry unit here is to, for the general, because in custom battle I can't, there are specific general units, and this is one of them. Normally I, it'd be with the strongest unit you have, so in this case it would be the Principes, but because this is a custom battle and some of the units aren't available, we're just going to have to have the cavalry unit here with our general. And the purpose of this, I could move them away right away, 
and not risk them engaging in the battle, making it a bit more uh, unrealistic. But it's just so it brings up the morale, as it would actually do if this was a defense battle on the campaign map. And because this is a custom battle, there are no Rorori or plebs, so I had to replace the plebs with levies who are just uh, on the order, strict orders by me to not fire at will and to always engage with melee. So that'll stop them from shooting at range and it will make them behave like plebs, although they do have shields. And because there were no Rorori, I put the next weakest unit, spear unit the Romans have, which is the Vigiles. It isn't as weak, but it is still as close as we can get to it. So let's get started. Now I am going to move my cavalry out of the way of combat because they aren't supposed to be in this battle. They're just the morale booster, which normally would be there. So we're going to move them out of combat if necessary. So right now, what I'm thinking, oh, this is going quite well. I thought they were going to go here, but all of a sudden, they seem to be going down the center. Then I see the next cavalry unit, I'm like, yeah, they might actually go down the center. But no, they actually end up also going down to the right side. So let's watch what happens here. The enemy prepares for a charge. And we are bracing for the charge and... The charge is actually quite well stopped. And look at all that fire, wow. And the cavalry charges through, but because we were in formation and we didn't charge out to meet the enemy cavalry, we were able to brace. Because if we had charged out to meet the attacking forces, we would have not braced so well and would have been easily crushed by this cavalry charge, especially because they were in diamond formation. But because we held formation, which is very valuable and useful when fighting off against cavalry forces, you have to hold formation, we, are, we were able to stand our ground, put our shields up, and instead of tiring ourselves, we were able to prepare ourselves for what it was to come. Now I see what's going on. I have noticed that the entire enemy force has gone down the right side, so I move the center units up to try and surround the enemy units. But I have also done what I planned, I only put soldiers on the left side so they could have an easier access to flank around because I thought the enemy would engage us in the center. So only the left side could flank around and then assist the center and then they both go to fight on the right side. But because they all went to the right side, I can send both of these now to flank. And this will be a vital part of the strategy. So when you are outnumbered, what you should do is try to block off as many choke points as possible. Or at least the ones that you are, or if you're strained on numbers and don't have many units, you should at least block off the choke points like I did here, that you are expecting the enemy forces to mostly come from. Which, if you're facing AI, it's usually where they're starting off at. Where they start the battle off at. Then what you want to do is you want to go in, hold them in a straight line. You don't want, sometimes... Square formation and other formations like that are very useful, but in the, and testudo formation is quite useful against these missiles. Unfortunately, I had not thought of that during this battle and let my troops be massacred by this fire. Fortunately, we had been unblocked by the enemy forces and our troops were able to flank around the enemy and quickly arrive, surprising the enemy and inflicting pretty good damage. Now what we're going to have to do is to continue chasing down these skirmishers because they aren't routing, so I'm going to have one of the Hastati units continue chasing them, but the other Hastati unit is going to charge in. Now this is because although the Principes are very strong and are doing amazingly well currently, we don't want to take that many casualties because for all we know, if this is a campaign battle, there could be a second army nearby and we want to save as many lives as possible. But when you are against such odds like here, you see that you are so greatly outnumbered, they have... Well, and this time the units are actually quite close in numbers, but... Some battles you are just so greatly outnumbered, you might have just five, six units and they have a full stack. In those cases, you just want to do like you're, I'm doing here. You want to hold the best points possible. You want to 
lowered down to as few choke points as possible. You want to funnel them in to one way, like here. And then you want to surround them to do as much damage as possible. So as you see, because I was taking so much fire and my principes were starting to face some more resistance, I decided to send in these two Hastati units to engage as well. But because we have surrounded the enemy forces, the enemy has actually begun routing, which is extremely surprising. Well, it actually isn't, because it's logical. Imagine you charging in, your strong Carthaginian hoplites. You see these puny Romans trying to hold off against you. Their cavalry isn't even engaging you for some reason. Who knows why? And you so greatly outnumber, and that one unit is just holding up by itself, with no help. Well then, you'd want to continue fighting. But then when you see that, oh no, those other two units just joined in, and then, oh no, the rest of their half of their forces are charging in behind us, we are completely trapped, then of course you're going to run. So victory has been achieved. The entire enemy force is now routing. Now I'm just going to speed up time because now I was just continuing to chase them to show how much damage you can truly do. I could have just ended the battle and you know what? That would have been still pretty good, but I don't want it to show you that no, even when you are this greatly outnumbered, no matter how tired your men are, you can still chase down and inflict some heavy damage. Now I know this replay didn't show it, but sometimes victory is not possible. This time we managed to hold them and outsmart the Carthaginians. But sometimes the enemies, although you will be greatly prepared, although you'll do this and you'll flank them around and do everything in your power and everything correctly, the enemy will just have quantity over quality. You might have these quality principes and hastadis. You might even have legionnaires or legionaries. But unfortunately, if the enemy has 20 units and you have five of these units, they'll do plenty of damage for you, but Eventually, they'll be so tired and beaten up that they can't fight forever. So I'm going to go over this one more time while we're waiting for the battle to end. If you're playing against the AI, and against players, this might work too, you want to form up where you expect them to come from. So in this case, it was where the enemy deployed at. So we expected them to come the right and center. But you also want to prepare some troops, like I did on the left side, so you can flank around and assist your troops, because flanking around is very important. Now, if you want to use everything to your advantage, you have terrain advantage, do it. Go for it. Being on top of a hill will be... It might seem small, but it actually will make a big difference. Just by moving your levies and velites behind the enemy, instead of shooting, shooting over the heads of your men, instead, you could move them to the side, or maybe even move them behind the enemy forces, it allows you to shoot them where they're unprotected by their shields, and you can do much more damage. So in these battles, when you know that victory is impossible or so unlikely that you might as well just inflict as much damage as possible, take the risk and chances you are given. No matter what, you cannot give up. As you see here, this time we were actually quite evenly matched, which is quite rare. <laughs> Normally a garrison will be greatly outnumbered. But I just took... Now, if you're wondering what research I did before this video, uh, what I did, I did... I played multiple campaigns. I didn't finish them. I started multiple campaigns and played a, quite a few turns in them, maybe three campaigns all as Rome, and what I did was I quite early on uh, captured and expanded, and then I declared a lot of enemies, which was regretful, but it showed me how quickly and what types of forces these enemies might actually get. So let's see how this battle went. We had 1,480 soldiers. We lost 43, but the enemy only killed 68, so that means we had about five from friendly fire. The enemy deployed 1,560. They lost 1,339. 1, wow, 100. We didn't even lose 100. And that's a lot because we only killed... We actually killed 1,338 of them. So one was only due to friendly fire. And that's amazing. 
So this this might this battle itself might not show it, but even against impossible odds, victory is still possible. All right, so I know I could have ended the video at that, but I wanted to show you why you should never give up. Now this isn't the perfect example of why you should never give up, but I think this makes a bit of a good point. So this is basically a maxed out town with a maxed out uh, auxiliary barracks, which is the second type of barracks the Romans have. So we have three units of legionnaires, we have, I believe, two levies, two velites, two plebs, and one vigiles. Finally vigiles, no longer aurorae. And we are fighting uh, the local tribes now. I don't really know how to pronounce their name. So once again, what I'm doing is the same thing as I did in the previous battle. I'm going to form up a line where I expect the majority of the enemy to come from. I see the enemy is formed up like this, with the majority of them to the right side. Well, I call this the right side because right, center, and then because they could flank around to the left like this, although that's quite unlikely for the AI to do. So what I decided to do is to put my all three of my legionnaire units on the right side because that is where the majority of the enemy is positioned. Then I put my vigiles and plebs to the center here because I saw some of their units actually quite close to this side and I expected them to charge up this hill because the AI does sometimes try to flank you. I expected them to charge up this hill and attack me and try to hit me in the back. So I was expecting an attack. I had skirmishers behind them here so they could shoot over their heads and I had skirmishers over here to help stop this charge because I know vigiles and plebs won't really be able to hold off heavy cavalry and heavy infantry for long. So let's get started and see how this goes. Yeah, exactly what the general said. We may be outnumbered, but all we have to do for victory is keep our heads. Now, I'm not going to spoil the outcome of this battle, and but all I'm going to say is this isn't a perfect example of why you should never give up. I have had one of those battles, but I forgot to save the replay. But I will try to continue playing the campaign to show you one of those perfect examples why you should never give up. But now let's see how the enemy heavy cavalry charges into our men. Imagine being one of these soldiers and seeing you are so greatly outnumbered and yet still being ready and holding and being even kind of excited and prepared for such heavy, heavy resistance from the enemy. And the enemy begins by trying to shoot into our ranks. Now I'll tell you what's going on there after this charge. And the enemy does a brutal charge through our lines. He cripples our lines. Now the majority of these men that had fallen down are still alive, but it was just very damaging for them to just charge in and throw them back because it pushes our entire unit back slightly and it inflicts some serious damage that really assists them and now with that cavalry charge still continuing the infantry joins in but now let me show you what's going on if you may have guessed I have noticed that the enemy has sent their entire force down the right side instead of going down and trying to flank me which was very surprising to me so what I decided to do is use this ridge to my advantage I thought to myself, well, they can't engage their entire force at the same time, so they're going to be sitting ducks here, waiting to be killed. So I sent my men up this ridge. I put my plebs and vigiles to guard them, but I still expected a cavalry charge, so I sent my vigiles back to guard this, because I expected this, that to quickly be retaken by the enemy forces. Surprisingly, they did not do that. The only problem with this ridge was the edge was very tall, which made it very difficult to shoot over. So I could only have units positioned here 
and here to shoot into the enemy ranks, while any units here had to go all the way around to the right side. So although it was nice to get some damage in, it wasn't quite worth it, because we were taking casualties from the enemy, and we were not shooting that much as I had planned. Our legionnaires are going to hold as we thought. They even started pushing forward. Now what you normally should do is just hold a straight line and wait for it all to end while you continue flanking. But in this case, seeing as there's so many of them and they're all engaging us in this line, which is kind of spreading out their forces quite evenly, well, not for the left and right side of the front line, but let's say it is kind of spread out evenly, but this allows us to push forward and slowly actually control and trap the enemy because by pushing forward it allows us to move up, move up and not only push them back from our land, but it also allows us to slowly move them into this formation of our choosing, into a ball or other formation that we choose. And then they'll be just sheep to the slaughter. So right now we are holding quite well, but unfortunately the enemy has started taking the toll on our men. But I have noticed that the enemy is quite occupied, and although they aren't sending their entire force to engage our legionnaires, they're just standing there. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to take a serious risk. I'm going to risk this entire battle to hopefully have a better outcome. I sent all of my units that were out of ammunition, my levies, my velites, my plebs, my vigiles. This unit still had ammunition, so I said, you know what, shoot it into them. But the other units, I was going to send them back here, actually behind the enemy, to trap them inside. Although the Romans have, legionnaires have taken quite a few casualties by now, they are still holding quite well. Um, their morale is slowly dropping, but overall they are holding up, which is exactly what we need in these kinds of battles. That's right, soldier, give it your all. Make these barbarians pay for attacking this land. So right now our troops have arrived, and I thought, you know what, it'd be nice to allow all of my troops to get here, and we could charge together. But the enemy decided, no, we're going to ruin your perfect plan. And they sent their skirmishers to attack our men. And I said, no, I'm not going to let you kill all of my men. So I was forced to charge in. It was either charge in and block them up right away, and wait for the rest of our forces to arrive, or fall, or either hold here and wait to be taking heavy casualties or fall back and possibly face repercussions that may be them chasing us all the way around and we might not hold back there. So now we have them completely surrounded. I'm just moving my cavalry up because the units have moved up so the general would move up in the battle itself as well. So we have completely surrounded the enemy at this point, which is quite good, it would seem, normally. But in this situation, it is not so good. The front line is buckling slowly, and the secondary line, which is surrounding the enemy force, is so lightly armored and facing heavily armored opponents that it is... I'm not sure if it was a good idea to do so, because they're dying extremely quickly with little progress being made. Unfortunately, we made a grave mistake, which may have led to the demise of this battle. We continued pushing, and unfortunately the front line didn't push evenly. So if you look closely, you can see that 
the left side of the front line is still holding the original position. They have slightly moved up because they were behind this rock. Now they're almost ahead of it. But unfortunately, the center of the front line, which has taken the most casualties, which makes it the most vulnerable, it has moved up ahead of the entire front line. So the enemy is not only engaging us all the way back here and just here, but they can also try and flank us very easily. And there's really no support to aid these soldiers here. Now they have absolutely massacred anyone that has faced them, but it may not be good enough. And just as I predicted, unfortunately, the secondary line begins to fall. Although there, were, uh, there was a lot of quantity, the quality wasn't good enough. Even these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or more units, they couldn't hold it on their own. They may have been all together, they may have been fighting together and all stabbing at one of these guys, but there was just too many of these guys with so much armor. And with the back line completely ruined, with only a few men still standing to continue fight, fighting, the entire enemy force is now allowed to continue. And just as I expected, the center, which was so weak, has completely fallen, which is now terrible news. And I'm still keeping the cavalry nearby because the general is on the left side here, in the left unit, which in the unit order, it was the first legionary unit. And because we were surrounded, this allowed the enemy to easily flank us. And that made the right side of the front line buckle, and then eventually the left side buckled as well. But, surprisingly, the game considers it a close defeat. Let's see why. Now those, those are good numbers. Although this wasn't a victory, we truly made these barbarians work for this town. And we've left them as an easy target to be picked off by a nearby army, if there is a nearby one. If there isn't, then their one, their one better be there soon. So the enemy had nearly twice the number of men we had. Which means we should have fallen a lot faster than we actually did. And surprisingly, although we were outnumbered, we did much more damage than they did. The majority of our casualties were, of course, due to the enemy attacking us, but a few were due to friendly fire. But overall, I think this battle went very well, although it was a defeat, although many men died, although the town is lost. These barbarians paid a much higher price. We fought against impossible odds, and we, if we held on a bit longer, we might have even won. And if we had actually, instead of using our plebs, levies, velites, and vigiles to surround the enemy and engage their heavy, ar heavily armored units, if we just kept them off to the side, we would have still done a lot of casualties and taken maybe half of our losses. Because the majority of our losses were just of the units in the back. And the majority of their kills, yeah. So I would like to, for the last time in this episode, I'd like to say that, remember, put as few choke points as possible. You want to have as many men able to fight, ready, not tired, and in good condition. Instead of holding maybe five different choke points, you want to hold maybe one, two, maybe even three. If you want to hold as few as possible, so you can have as many men as you can on the front line to continue holding it for as long as possible as the three legionary, legionary units did. But you also want to keep some so you can flank around like our weakest units did. Normally, like in the first battle shown in this video, you want to have moderately strong, if not strong units, to flank around because these weak units as we saw here although they did do some good damage 
it wasn't really enough because we have to remember these four units, they actually shot into the enemy ranks. These two pleb units, they actually only fought at the back. Now these Vigiles, they got some good kills. But we have to remember and think how much these four units actually kill, which I guess in the back it must have been much less. So remember, few choke points, have your strongest units guarding the choke points, and leave some units to flank around. And try to position your ranged units at such an angle so that they have easy access to the enemy's weakest points, which is at their sides and back. Because at the front they have their shields, and probably the most armor to protect them. I hope this video was helpful, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, I hope you like and subscribe and share it with your friends so they can also learn how to beat these impossible battles. Now, this is just the first episode of this series. This series will focus on all of the, well, not all of the, the majority of the units in Rome too. We will be going over not every single faction, but the general units and factions because multiple factions share very similar unit rosters. So why go over multiple factions with almost the same unit roster when we could just go over mo a few factions but still cover, cover the same amount of units and details. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you watching the next episode. Please remember to leave your comments, ideas, and suggestions in the comment section below so I know how to improve and so I can make content that you want to see. Thank you.